Okay. Hello, everyone. This is the March webinar for 2024, presented by the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors, which now includes the Franco-Ontarian Research Centre. My name is Linda Urquhart. I'll be your host for tonight. Uh, Cindy Robichaud and Pat Clancy are with us, and they'll be monitoring the questions. Thanks to them for doing that. Before we start, we always want to acknowledge that the land on which the County of Essex is located is the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. These include the Huron or Wendat or Wyandotte bands. As family historians, we look for the stories of the men and women who came before us. In doing that, we must acknowledge the mistakes of the past and consider how we can best support our local Indigenous communities. Thanks for joining us. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and will be added to the Essex County Branch YouTube channel. When you go to YouTube, just search for Essex and then capital O-G-S slash capital O-N-T and click on the video tab. Also at this meeting, everyone is muted and your camera is turned off during the presentation. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Just post your questions in the chat box as we go along. The chat box can be found by hovering your mouse at the bottom of your screen. Here is our contact information. Our web page includes a member's library for Essex Branch members. Our Facebook group is very active and has over 1,200 members. Many research questions are asked there and, and some of them are answered there. Our YouTube channel offers most of the previous webinars back to 2016 before COVID and when we had in-person meetings. We try to post notices of events and other interesting genealogical photos on Instagram. And you can always email us with any questions you have about your own family research. We're pleased to be able to introduce you to the very interesting Zoom webinars coming soon. On Tuesday, March 26th, the Family Tree Maker User Group meets at 2 p.m. On April the 4th at 7 p.m., Ontario Ancestors presents how AT DNA and Big Y DNA lead to the big surprise. So that looks like it would be fun. Register for that webinar on the Ontario Ancestors webpage at ogs.on.ca. Then on April the 9th at 7 p.m., the Essex and Kent branches are co-hosting a webinar called Genealogical Research Through Religious Repositories. Religious institutions are rich in local and familial historical records. Des Nakario, the archivist for the Diocese of Huron, will present the research services available to Essex and Kent County genealogists using Anglican archives as an example. And on Thursday, April the 11th at 9 p.m., Legacy Family Tree Webinars presents Artificial Intelligence and Family History, an introduction. That seemed to be quite a topic that everybody was interested in at the last Roots Text Conference. And you can register for that webinar at familytreewebinars.com. And we hope to see you in June at the Ontario Ancestors Conference, the 14th and 16th. There is an Artificial Intelligence and Genealogy Day on Thursday, June 13th. There are tours of Toronto on Thursday and Friday before the conference begins. There are 62 varied sessions over the weekend, including sessions from some very marquee speakers. There will be 50-plus exhibitors in the marketplace and special pricing at the hotel and subsidized pricing for meals. I'm sure many of you will want to take advantage of this spectacular event. Tonight's webinar is being presented by Jean Ray Baxter and is called Winter of Discontent, 1838. Jean will discuss her research of that time period and will introduce us to important political figures as well as some lesser known historical figures of the area. And a little bit about Jean. Jean is a descendant of a United Empire Loyalist. She holds a BA and MA from the University of Toronto and a B.Ed. from Queen's. Before becoming a full-time writer, she taught secondary school English in Lennox and Addington County. 
Although she was born in Toronto and grew up in Hamilton, down home was Essex and Kent counties where her ancestors had settled, some as loyalists in the 1780s following the American Revolution and some a century earlier in the days of New France. Jean wrote her first historical novel, The Way Lies North, in response to the need for responsible historical fiction to tell the story of the loyalists from a Canadian point of view. This book has been followed up by six more, of which the latest, Battle on the Ice, which was out as of 2023, focuses on the Patriot Rebellion in Upper Canada in 1837 to 1838. Her historical novels have won awards in Canada and the United States. In 2022, she was nominated for the Governor General's History Award for Popular Media, the Pierre Burton Award. And now with that introduction, Jean, we're glad to have you here tonight and I will turn it over to you now for your presentation. I'll just get your screens going. Thank you very much. I don't know whether you can see me or not. Am I on the... Yep, we can see you. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. I don't just have one loyalist ancestor. I have a couple of dozen loyalist ancestors, and and they're sprinkled all. They were sprinkled all through Essex and Kent counties. And that's why Essex and Kent has always been down home to me. Well, uh, shall I? Uh, I see my slides showing there, so perhaps I should just um, start with my talk. And I'm at, uh, um, all right then. Well, the winter of discontent. Members of the United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada share a history reaching back to the 1780s when the first Loyalist settlements were established in what is now Canada. It is a history of which they are proud. Today, they are known as the United Empire Loyalists but they have not always been united in their loyalty. There was an era when that loyalty was severely strained, and that was the time of the Patriot Revolt, when the grandsons of the original Loyalists took opposing sides in a conflict that brought Upper and Lower Canada to the brink of civil war. How did this happen? The purpose of this talk is to answer that question and to show its importance in Canadian history. After leaving everything behind in what became the United States, the Loyalist ancestors made a new start in the wilderness to the north. They began with next to nothing. They struggled to survive. And then, after two generations, their efforts began to bear fruit. They had time and energy to think about other things, such as politics and the workings of government. When they took a close look, they did not like what they saw. In Upper Canada, an elite ruling class was in charge of almost everything. This did not happen by accident. John Graves Simcoe, the first lieutenant governor, had been determined that democracy must never be established in this province. Simcoe believed that democracy was no better than anarchy. He believed good government could be provided only by men of an aristocratic upper class educated to rule. And so, by the 1830s, many of the grandsons of the original loyalists realized that loyalty had made them part of a system based on inequality. They did not want a break with Britain. They had no interest in Upper Canada becoming a republic, but they were frustrated by the system in which an, an entrenched group of privileged families, the family compact, enjoyed for themselves all the wealth and power. In Battle on the Ice, this is how a recruiter for the Patriots describes it to young Dory Dixon, the central character in the book, who was tired and rather go to bed than listen to a lecture. This is what the recruiter says. 
There are people who believe that democracy is dangerous and that power should remain in the hands of a ruling class. I yawned, seeing this he frowned. Dory, pay attention. These people, the family compact, control everything in Upper Canada, not just the government. They also run the church and the law courts. They really are one big family because they intermarry so that the strands are all twisted together. Brothers, sons, uncles, nephews, all have their fingers in the pot. This situation would be bad even if they gave us good government, but they don't. They're greedy, incompetent, and corrupt. His voice grew louder and louder as if he were giving a speech to a big crowd and not just to one boy who might be too sleepy to pay attention, he continued. That's why simple farmers and shopkeepers are ready to take up arms. We must seize power from the family compact and give it to the common people. Well, the system of government was designed to keep it the way it was. There was an, edu an elected assembly. There was an executive council. There was the lieutenant governor appointed by the British government. The left lieutenant governor appointed all the members of the executive council, and you could be sure he appointed only men who shared his views. Just to be sure that the elected assembly did not pass any laws of which the ruling class disapproved, the executive council and the left lieutenant governor each had the power to veto any act passed by the assembly. This was the situation when William Lyon Mackenzie arrived in Upper Canada in 1820. Slide, please. William Lyon Mackenzie, is he up? I can't see that, I can't see this as he is. Okay, he's up, all right, thank you. Mackenzie had fought against injustice in his native Scotland, and now he found that the situation here was no better. In 1824, he published the first issue of a newspaper, The Colonial Advocate, which immediately became a leading voice for reform. In 1828, he was elected to the House of Assembly. In 1834, when the reformers won a majority in the newly elected Toronto City Council, he was elected Toronto's first mayor. At the end of 1838, he was elected to the House of Assembly again. Although nothing he did produced any change, the British government appeared to be listening. Then the British government committed a grievous blunder. It appointed Sir Francis Bond Head as Lieutenant Governor. Next slide. Bond Head has the dubious distinction of having both incited and crushed the Upper Canada Rebellion. He was a friend of Mrs. Simcoe. Like her late husband, she detested democracy and rejoiced that Bond Head would put a stop to all that silly talk about reform in Upper Canada. Bondhead's orders from the British government were to mediate between the reformers and those who resisted change. He did not follow those orders. Instead, resolved to destroy the reformers in his own words, mercilessly destroy them root and branch. Reformers dominated the elected assembly. So he called an election. To get the result he wanted, he spread the false rumor that the reformers were secretly allied with the United States. He used the careful selection of polling places to ensure that no reformer could possibly win. He waved the loyal flag, denouncing the reformers as enemies of the crown. The strategy worked. Every reformer lost his seat in the assembly. By late fall 1837, an embittered Mackenzie turned his mind to revolution. 
The reformers took up arms. They called themselves patriots, and so the rebellion has become known as the Patriot Rebellion. These men had no military training. Most were farmers and shopkeepers. At the Battle of Montgomery's Tavern in Toronto in 1837, next slide, please. There we are. And it, the Patriot soldiers scattered in every direction as soon as the regular army arrived. Two men were killed and Montgomery's Tavern was burned to the ground. To make his escape, Mackenzie had to strip off his clothes and swim across a river full of floating ice. Lieutenant Governor Bond Head, who had been sent from Britain to mediate, actually led the government forces in the battle, waving his sword. Two months later, south of the border, William Lyon Mackenzie, in exile, after the failure of his attempt at revolution, convinced American sympathizers that most Canadians would welcome an invasion that would set them free from British tyranny. In this, he deluded himself. He established the Republic of Canada with himself as president and Navy Island in the Niagara River as its capital. The Republic of Canada had its own flag. Next slide. There we are. You can see from the, the, the style of it uh, that he must have had some help from his new American friends in designing his flag for, for Upper and Lower Canada, the two stars. Mackenzie persuaded American sympathizers that the ordinary people of Upper Canada would rise up in revolution in order to gain the kind of freedom that Americans enjoyed. He must have been very persuasive because American sympathizers, mainly from Ohio, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania, came forward to help the oppressed Canadians in their fight. They were organized into so-called hunters' lodges, secret organizations, which became the cover for men ready to take up arms to end British rule in Upper and Lower Canada. In 1837 to 1838, during the Patriot Rebellion, they were responsible for at least 14 armed incursions from the United States into Upper Canada. Each has a significant part in our history. Sugar Island, Bois Blanc, Bablo, Hickory Island, Fighting Island, Battle of the Windmill in Prescott in Eastern Ontario, the Battle of Windsor, the invasion of Pelee Island was one of these. As for Bond Head, when word got back to Britain about his interference in the election, he was replaced and never held office again. But it was too late to repair the damage he had done. The government in Upper Canada had a full-fledged rebellion on its hands. The American sympathizers did not know that Mackenzie had seriously misjudged the situation. The Upper Canada reformers did not want a republic. They just wanted justice and the end of privilege. That's how matters stood when, in late February 1838, an American armed force crossed the ice from Sandusky, Ohio, and invaded defenseless Peavy Island as a first step to invading Upper Canada. New slide, please. Printing of the map of Peavy Island. This was, without doubt, the most important event in Pelee Island's history. It is also important in the history of Canada. The people who lived on Pelee Island knew that an invasion was coming. For months, there had been rumors that American sympathizers were preparing for a war that would sever up her Canada's ties with Great Britain. In the 1830s, Pelee Island was owned by William McCormick. Slide, please. 
William McCormick. William McCormick had purchased the island in 1823 from Thomas McKee, an important political figure whose mother was a Shawnee woman. William McCormick settled there permanently with his family in 1834. When McCormick heard of the plan to invade Pelee Island, he gathered together his family and his tenants and fled to the mainland. They fled in sleighs over the ice, taking only a few personal belongings with them. When they arrived in Colchester, William McCormick sent word to Colonel John Maitland, the commandant at Fort Malden in Amherstburg. The feared invasion came on February the 26th under the command of Colonel Edwin Bradley, Major Lester Hoadley, and Captain Henry Van Rensselaer. They crossed the ice pulling sleds loaded with guns and ammunition. As for provisions, they hoped to take all they would need from the islanders. The occupying force numbered as many as a thousand from time to time. Men came and went by sleigh for five days. They stripped Pelee Island bare of food stores and livestock, damaged homes and barns, and looted everything they could carry. They stole the lamps, lenses, and mirrors from the lantern of the Pelee Island lighthouse. Next slide. Here is a passage from Battle on the Ice describing the scene. The person speaking is the same youth, Dory Dixon. The further I went, the more crowded the road became. We passed sleds and sleighs laden with bulging grain sacks, cow hides, apple barrels, sides and quarters of beef and pork, and skinned lamb carcasses. I saw a pile of dead chickens sharing a sled with a whetstone and a spinning wheel. Another sled was heaped with shiny glass objects that flashed and sparkled and gleamed in the sunshine. Some flared with colors like a rainbow. What was this? Then it came to me. I was looking at the lamps, lenses, and mirrors from the lantern of the Pelee Island lighthouse. Was there nothing that these bandits would not steal? The Patriot invasion of Canada looked more like a looting expedition than a military action. Why did the Patriots need 40 muskets? Why did they need any? Whom were they going to fight? There were no Canadian or British troops stationed on Pelee Island. The people had no defense. By the time Colonel Maitland's army arrived on the morning of March the 3rd, the invading force numbered fewer than 400 men, down from 1,000 to 400. The looters, having got what they came for, were safely back in Ohio. Colonel Maitland's army was composed of experienced British regulars. Some of these soldiers were veterans of the Battle of Waterloo. There was one company of Canadian militia, the Essex Light Infantry Volunteers, and a detachment of 30 cavalry belonging to the Sandwich Troop of Cavalry and to the St. Thomas Troop of Cavalry, as well as a small party of First Nations warriors. Colonel Maitland's army came with two cannon six-pounders, which, as it turned out, were never used. Colonel Layton's plan was not just to defeat the invading army and free Pelee Island. He wanted to capture the enemy's soldiers and march them back to Fort Malden as prisoners of war. The strategy was to drive them out of the island and round them up before they could escape back to Ohio. Let's have a slide. slide. Okay, here's the map. Here's the map again. 
you see the colored line there, does it show? I don't know whether I can make it show for you or not, but that is the international border there at the time and pretty well still is. Maitland's army marched across the ice and came ashore at the north end of Pelee Island, expecting a battle. But the enemy had already fled, heading south through the interior. Unless they were intercepted, they would have rushed from the southern tip of Pelee Island across the ice, due south to the safety of the, of the American mainland. To prevent their escape, Colonel Maitland made use of all three branches of his army. He sent the British regulars down the west side of Pelee Island to take up a position at Fish Point. He sent the Sandwich and St. Thomas Cavalry down the east side to the southern tip, and he ordered the Essex militia to scour the interior from north to south, driving the enemy out of Pelee Island and onto the ice, where British regulars were waiting to block their flight. Thus the fleeing enemy, when they emerged from the island, faced British regulars in front of them, the Canadian cavalry on their right flank, and the Canadian militia coming up at their backs. There was no way for them to escape without a battle. Next slide. The battle on the ice. You see there that they're they're not uh, they're not regular soldiers. They don't have the they don't have the uniforms. They didn't have the training either. And here come here comes the regular army, trained Canadians and and trained British soldiers. And uh, um, it uh, what happened speak spoke for itself. To do them credit, the American officers in charge did a good job of rallying their men and lining them up in battle order. For two volleys of gunfire, they fought bravely. But then the British regulars attached their bayonets. At the cry, fix bayonets, charge. The half-trained enemy soldiers took one look at those gleaming 17-inch blades and fled in disarray. Some back onto the island to hide in the swamp, and the rest in a dash south toward the United States mainland with the Sandwich and St. Thomas cavalry in hot pursuit, until one of their horses, hooves, broke through the ice, and the commander of the cavalry ordered a halt. The Battle of Pelee Island was over in one hour. Colonel Maitland's army loaded the casualties onto sleighs and marched the prisoners under guard back to Fort Malden. From there they were sent to Toronto, awaiting trial. When they came to trial, the sentences were quite lenient. No one was executed. Some went to prison. The men considered ringleaders were deported to Van Diemen's land, Tasmania, where most of them spent the rest of their lives and where their descendants live today. Why did they not return? Because though the government was provided the passage to Van Diemen's land. It did not provide the return passage to Canada, which would have been extremely expensive. So they were pardoned, but it didn't make much difference. The invaders, though, who escaped back to Pelee Island were promptly arrested by the United States authorities. Their weapons were confiscated, and they were told to go home and don't try it again. President Britain and the United States had a treaty of neutrality, which President Van Buren was determined to uphold. Any further armed incursions into British North America would be punished with imprisonment and or steep fines. For the residents of Pelee Island, the ordeal was over. Their livestock and their Food supplies had been stolen. Their property had been plundered. Before them lay the challenge of, re of recovering what they had lost. The British government was quick to provide compensation for losses the residents had suffered. 
Keeley Island soon regained the tranquility it has enjoyed ever since. Next slide. Monument to the soldiers who died at the Battle of Pelee Island. The monument states, this monument is erected by the inhabitants of Amherstburg in memory of Thomas McCartan, Samuel Holmes, Edwin Miller, and Thomas Simons of Her Majesty's 32nd Regiment of Foot and of Thomas Parrish of the St. Thomas Volunteer Cavalry, who gloriously fell in repelling a band of brigands from Pelee Island on the 3rd of March, 1838. Not only is the monument half buried today, but the top of the monument needs repair. Fortunately, due to local interest in restoring the monument, Within a few years, it may again stand fully revealed and restored as a memorial to an important part of our history. By the, wind, by the winter of 1837 to 1838, the British government now recognized that something was very wrong in both Canadian provinces, Upper Canada and Lower Canada. On March the 30th, 1838, the government appointed the Earl of Durham governor-in-chief of British North America and commissioned him to investigate the causes of the rebellion. Next slide, please. John George Lampton, first Earl of Durham. In Lower Canada, Quebec, the problem was the deep hostility between the French and the English an issue totally different from the problem in Upper Canada at that time. Lord Durham's proposed solution was assimilation, the disappearance of French as an official language. This proposal was as unacceptable then as it would be today, where the population of Lower Canada stood firm in their determination to keep their language and culture. But for Upper Canada, Durham was an excellent choice. He was a leading reformer and played a major role in the passage of the British Reform Bill of 1832, which had extended the franchise, giving the right to vote to a wide range of men who were not property owners, and at the same time, removing barriers to the election of, of Roman Catholics. When he was sent to Canada, he already had the nickname Radical Jack. Lord Durham's famous report contained a long list of the grievances of the colonists, along with the recommendation that the government of the colonies should be in the hands of the people themselves. His report was laid before the British Parliament in the spring of 1839 in the fall of the same year, Lord John Russell, the colonial secretary, issued written dispatches to the new governor, up, new governor of Upper Canada, Lord Sydenham. These dispatches, which gave clear instructions to carry out Lord Durham's recommendations, have been called the Magna Carta of colonial self-government. It took a few years and some conflicts before the principle of responsible government was firmly established, but the final triumph was never in doubt. Because of the measures that, that Lord Durham recommended, the power of the family compact in Upper Canada was ended. As well, these measures set in motion the process of political reform that would lead to representative government, fair elections, and step-by-step to Confederation in 1867. Well, my purpose is always to tell Canada's story from a Canadian point of view. And in the case of the Battle of Pelee Island, I had a personal interest as well. At the time of the Patriot Rebellion, my great, 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 three greats, grandfather, George Fox, 
lived on Pelee Island. Next slide, please. Here is his cedar log cabin. Today, it is the oldest inhabited dwelling on Pelee Island. George Fox built it in the 1830s. George Fox's brothers, John and Henry, also lived on Pelee Island. All three brothers suffered losses at the hands of the American invaders. George and his family are characters in, the way, in Battle on the Ice. But there was another brother, Jacob Fox, who lived on the mainland in Gosfield Township, near the hamlet of Albertville, now part of Kingsville, on the north shore of Lake Erie. He was a patriot. If you read Battle on the Ice, you will see that hereby hangs another part of the tale. Although the political situation in Upper Canada did not reach the stage of brother against brother, it was getting close. Loyalty ran deep, but it was like the ice on Lake Erie that winter. Fifteen inches thick, except in those places where currents had hollowed it out from underneath. In those spots, those trusting it were on very thin ice. Today, they rest, they rest in peace. Next slide. Jacob Fox's grave in Gosfield. He's buried in Gosfield, where after the rebellion, he lived a long and quiet life. The next slide. George Fox and Juliana Weigel, my own ancestors. George Fox died less than two years after the Battle of Pelee Island, for in November 1839, he was drowned when the boat in which he was traveled capsized. William McCormick, a passenger on the same boat, was rescued. And this I record as a small footnote to history. History. We do not own our history. It is part of us what we have been and what we are. Our responsibility is to take care of it. We do this when we build monuments, and when we take care of old cemeteries where our ancestors rest in peace. Some of us write books to tell our story, and this is the part that I want to play. I started my research for Battle on the Ice back in 2015. It took a long time to put all the pieces together. COVID did not help, but it was with a feeling of total satisfaction in June 2023, I finally held the book in my hand. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, before uh, we pass it on to Cindy and Pat for questions, I'm just wondering where is that monument to the the fall the the men that fell? Oh, uh, to uh, the to the uh, to the monument to the men who died. Yeah, it's in Amherstburg. Oh, it's in Amherstburg. Oh, I thought it would be on Pelee Island. No, <laughs> no. no. San Lambertsburg. There's a there's a plaque on Pelee Island, but the but uh, the 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 monument is 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 on the mainland. It's I suppose. Oh yes, that uh, on the the land where it is uh, located actually was part of the burial ground for for the military for the military for the regiment at Fort Malden. So it was very appropriately there. Mm. And uh, why were George and Julianne? Um, buried in Ohio. Oh well, George was drowned, you see, and um, and his body came, and his body uh, uh, came ashore at North Bass Island. This is re quite remarkable because this was, of course, uh, um, in in 1839, and he was only in his fifties. Juliana lived on in Pelee Island until the age of until she was about ninety, and when she died. 
her family actually took her across to Bass, North Bass Island so they could be buried together. I see. I didn't know this for a long time when I looked for her in the graveyard on Peony Island. It was only when somebody else uh, that was investigating an ancestor uh, came across this that she wasn't like, couldn't, there's no point looking for her on Peony Island. She's, she's resting in peace over on North Bass with her, with her husband. But hmm. uh, she had many children, of course. They had many children. They had 11 children. But uh, for those times, that wasn't even unusual. No, we found that out ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, Cindy and Pat, do we have any questions? Hi, Linda, this is Pat. Um, mm -hmm. There's two questions that have popped up um, in my chat. One is, you mentioned the McCormicks as residents on Peely when the invasion happened. How many yes. others were there at that time? So what was How the many others were there? Uh, I don't think there's any actual record of how many, but uh, there probably there were there were all his tenants. Let us say, his family and his tenants are uh, probably about forty people there. And oh, well, there were I don't think there were more than a hundred people living on Peely Island. I don't think I've ever come across an exact number of those. There were um, there were many. Let's see. The number of people who put in about fifty put in uh, put in uh, requests for for compensation. When I have that list in my book of the various things that were stolen, now a lot of that comes from the the, the claims for compensation. You know the the uh, the hides and the spinning wheel and and those things. That is a good question. I'll try to find that out because I I really do not know exactly how many people were living there, but. Um, those who, those who did not flee the island were regarded with a certain amount of suspicion. Okay, so there was obviously not a lot of people there. Um, also ask, uh, do you know how many Americans fell the day of the battle? How many Americans fought the day of the battle? Fell. How many died? Well, how many Americans fell? That nobody knows because there were rumors that, uh, that, that a number of them had fallen through the ice. But those, um, but those rumors were, were never proven either way. And the United States was not keen on releasing any information about that. Yeah, they didn't want, they didn't want others to know how many people they might have lost. Hmm. Okay, now we have another question from Stephanie. It's interesting to compare the reaction of the British government to the situation in Upper Canada with the situation in the 13 colonies when the American Revolution broke out. Do you think the British government had learned its lesson, so to speak, oh, or yes. what else might have influenced it? The, 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 um, they certainly had learned their lesson, at least in part. Um, they, uh, for example, with the American, with, uh, before the American uh, Revolution, the British had wanted to keep um, the market open for themselves and they strongly discouraged any kind of manufacturing in the in the 13 colonies they didn't want them to have their own furniture shops and you know uh, making things like that uh, they wanted them to get their stuff from england but they they had um they discovered that this was not this was not wise and uh but but as as far as giving them a, a measure of self-government they had not really improved that at all but um they had set things up but with the big decisions were, were all being made in britain but of course that continued on for a very very long time it was um uh, if you if you look at more recent history it wasn't until the statute of westminster statute of westminster in uh, in 1933 that Canada even had the power to declare war on its own. World War I was declared by Britain for Canada. It was 1930, in 1939, we could do it ourselves, but Britain was very slow to let go of most of the reins of power, certainly in international, in international matters. But I think that I've gone beyond answering your question into something not relevant. Well, no, it's also very interesting. I uh, 
The history was not a strong point when I was young, but this is uh, quite fascinating now that I've got some older and have some interest uh, in, from the area. Um, we have another question that's come in from Debbie. After the rebellion, did the British establish regular troops in the area in case the Americans tried again? Oh yes, they were. They they certainly did. Fort Malden stayed to be uh, continued to be very important. There were a lot of uh, thought. Of, there were a lot of signs that the Americans might actually not just help rebels, but but have another invasion of of their own. I live in Kingston, where Fort Henry was was built about this time. Uh, with the deliberate, uh, just as a deliberate, as a stronghold uh, to repel an American invasion in this part. And it is interesting to note that no invasion came, and the very first use to which Fort Henry was put was to hold prisoners of war from the Patriot Rebellion. Uh, okay. Um, Cindy posted here that you're, in case, uh, attendees didn't notice in the chat Cindy has put a link to your book it's available at riverbookshop.com so yes it is in Amherstburg yes yeah I had so. um I had an opportunity to to give a talk at the river books store in in Amherstburg last September I had uh, a tour of a uh, book tour of the of the uh, of it around Essex County and I was in Essex and uh, 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 let's say Point Pili, um, a resource center and uh, in Harrow and uh, the three events on Pili Island. And actually I'm, I'm going to be returning to, to Essex County in, um, uh, in May, where I'm going to be at, um, the, it's called Spring Song on Pili Island. It's an annual event organized by, by Margaret Atwood. Uh, for literature and bird watching, and that's uh, around the eighth and tenth of uh, of May. But uh, I will be around, and I would very much look forward to some opportunities to to meet some of you, for that matter, if it's possible. All right. Well, those interested will have to watch out for the publicity around that. So that's May eighth to the tenth on Pili Island for Spring Song. Yes. And, uh, and then I'll they'll st I'll stay in the area for a few days and and I, I hope to go and visit your uh, your re research center in Windsor that uh, uh, the new French one I think think that would be extremely interesting okay um, and no other questions but we have a comment from Betty Ann that says thank you for your excellent presentation well thank you very much Betty Ann thank you. Cindy, do you have any questions that have come up from your end? Hi, okay. no, I, I don't. I just kept forwarding them over to you since my voice was kind of wonky tonight. Okay. Well, I just had one other. I hate to show my uh, ignorance of Canadian history. I should know this answer, but what what happened to William Lyon Mackenzie that started all this? Well, what happened to him eventually? Uh, he was eventually pardoned, and uh, after several years in in the states, he returned to Canada, and continued on as his his profession as a newspaper man. Uh. I can't remember when when he actually died, but he he uh, had quite a significant life after it was all over, and he he was pardoned. The British the British government really was after their their horrible mistake in in uh, in in sending bond head uh really really woke up to the whole situation they were as lenient as they as they could possibly have been and everybody got pardoned except the unfortunate two who had been hanged <laughs> right mm -hmm. okay that was, so that was the result of the of, of montgomery's tavern nobody got hanged as a result of the invasion of Pelee island um, by that yeah. time the government was british government was really seeing that the people <laughs> had every reason to be unhappy. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, uh, we want to thank Jean again. It was an excellent presentation. It it really brings to life how people lived in that time period, what was going on, and you made it just come alive for us, history alive. 
So we hope that everyone enjoys celebrating their Irish ancestors on St. Patrick's Day. And at the end of the month, we'll be enjoying the family visits during our Easter celebrations. We'll see you all again at our April webinar. But in the meantime, if you want to visit some of us in person, please visit the Franco-Ontarian Research Center here in Windsor on a Tuesday or on Sat the next Saturday that we're open is April the 13th. And we're open for visitors from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. And the directions to the center can be found on our webpage. Just look under the Franco-Ontarian Research Center tab. So until we meet again, until next time when we meet, I'd uh, just like to say good night, everybody. Thanks again, Jean. It was great. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. <laughs>